Welcome to Calvary. We're glad that you're here this morning with us. And we've been making our way through the Gospel of Luke. We come as far as the 21st chapter in the 20th verse. We're in the middle of Jesus' second longest sermon. It's called the Olivet Discourse. It was named that because of the location in which it was given. And it was there on the Mount of Olives, facing the Temple Mount and the place of worship for the Jews. Jesus, a few days, uh, I, I shouldn't even say a few days, earlier that day, Jesus had had a conversation with his disciples. He had told them that very soon that the whole temple would come tumbling down. Not one stone would be left upon another. And the disciples kind of astounded by, by Jesus making that comment. He, at that point, you know, just kind of goes to the other side of the, of, of the Temple Mount. And the disciples asked Jesus to further explain what he had just said. And they asked him two questions. They said, Jesus, when will these things be? And what will be the signs of the end of the age. So Jesus is, is going to answer those questions for the disciples. He's in those first few verses. Um, we've seen that Jesus told them that these things wouldn't happen immediately. That there would be a time that would transpire before uh, the end of the age would come. He told them there would be many false Christs that would come on the scene. A lot of false messiahs claiming to be him. He says, don't go after them. Don't follow them. Don't believe them. He told them there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be nation rising up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. He goes, and the, yet, the end's not yet. I mean, there's still, you know, those things are going to happen. And so Jesus was telling them that this wasn't some thing that was going to happen in the next few years or the next few you know, weeks, it was something that was going to happen over a period of time. He told them there's going to be great earthquakes. There was going to be famines and pestilence and natural disasters. They were going to suffer great persecution from governments. They were going to suffer great persecution even from their own family and from their own friends. Now, you know, every time there's some event take place, there's those that are going to say, you know, that was the sign of the end. Jesus is coming back next week or next month. Or I got a date for September 22. And, you know, there, there's all kinds of people trying to narrow down when that's going to happen. And Jesus, says, look, no one knows. But he did say this. He says, look, it's going to be like birth pangs. Now, when you know, what, what, you know, one of the things you find out about birth pangs, we, we've had four children and, and I've come to, understand the process a little bit. It starts off with, you know, you kind of got the, 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 the fake contractions. They kind of start, and then they go away for a couple of weeks, and then they start, and they come back. You know, you just kind of go like, is this it? Is this, is this it? And, you know, and then it like all settles down, and, and, and it doesn't happen. And then all of a sudden, the contractions start to happen, you know, more frequently. It goes from days to hours, and it goes from hours to minutes. And, you know, these things just start to happen greater intensity and greater frequency. And I think Jesus was telling the disciples, look, all these things are going to happen, but as we get closer to the end, it's, it's, it's going to be like birth pains. It's going to just happen on a greater intensity. It's going to happen in, in greater frequency, and you're going to know that the time is close, that the things are getting near. And it should cause you to, to take notice, to, to really be aware of, of what's going on around you. He told them that when they were persecuted, that they would stand before kings and they would stand before rulers. And they weren't to think about what they were going to say beforehand, but the Holy Spirit would tell them what to say in that very moment. And they would use it as a testimony to those rulers and kings. They were going to have an opportunity to share Jesus with these rulers and kings. And so all of these things that Jesus was telling them, the events that would happen, and he tells them in a big kind of, a, you know, kind of a long 
time period that's going to take place. As we begin verse 20, he's going to narrow it down to some very specific events that will take place. And I think these events are going to, you know, be more of the kind of, I, I'm aware that, you know, these things are getting closer and closer and closer. And so Jesus, as we begin verse 20, as he's talking about the end of the age, he's, he's going to give the disciples some practical stuff that's going to happen in, in their lifetime. And then he's going to give them some stuff that's going to be for that generation that's going to be alive during those uh, last days. And so uh, a lot to cover this morning. Let's begin in verse 20. We're going to read through verse 24, and then we'll come back and we'll expound on that. Watch what he says. And when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. And let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. Let not those who are in the country enter in to her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now Jesus is going to talk very specifically about the city of Jerusalem. And as he's talking about the city of Jerusalem, he's, he's telling uh, the disciples that there's going to be a destruction that's going to take place in Jerusalem. And when you see those things happen, when the armies start to surround Jerusalem, get out of Dodge. Don't even stick around. Don't even look back. Just get and go. And if you're out of the, in the country and you see you're coming into the, into the city limits and you see the armies surrounding, don't even go in. It's not a false alarm. It's not going to be, uh, you know, something that comes and goes. There's not going to be deliverance out of it because God is going to use that time to bring vengeance on the city of Jerusalem. Now, that, that, that's a heavy warning that Jesus gives his disciples. He, he, you know, he, he's really laying out with them, look, look, there's going to be a siege on the city. And when that siege comes, now this is what would happen in that day. Whenever an army was going to overtake a city, they would surround it with that, their troops. And they would cut off their food supply. That would be the first thing. they just wait it out. So if you're not able to bring, the, none of the fields were in the city. The fields were outside of the city. That's where they grew the wheat and the barley and the, and the grapes and everything and the olives. They would be all outside of the city limits. The city would be walled in. But if you cut off the food supply, you just wait out long enough and the people inside will have to either surrender or they'll have to, uh, you know, try to fight. There, there would be some, concert, and, and what we, we know, because what we're looking at is history now. Titus and his Roman guards surrounded the city of Jerusalem, 70 AD. It had been some 40 years after Jesus uh, had, had declared this thing to happen. It happens. The Romans come, they surround the city, they siege it, they cut off the food supply, and it was literally rioting inside. There, there was gangs that would go through and just steal the food from others. There was, there was people uh, throwing dead bodies over the, the wall because they didn't want them rotting inside the walls. And Jesus had warned. And, and you go, wait, wait a second, what, what, what's up with all of that? You mean Jesus, God is, is saying he's going to take vengeance on the people of Jerusalem? Is that, is that what God does? Does he take vengeance? Guys, I, I think somehow we have this perception of God that's not biblical. And one of the things you find out is that God does repay. God does take vengeance. And the city of Jerusalem is going to be the first place that vengeance is poured out after Jesus comes and he dies on that cross. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I want you to remember what just a few days from this scene that we're reading right here. Jesus is going to be taken before Pontius Pilate and the Roman legions that are there. And as 
They are crying for Jesus to be crucified. Pontius Pilate's going to stand up in front of this whole group of Jewish men and women that are crying out for his crucifixion and he's going to take a bowl and he's going to dip his hands into that bowl and then he's going to wash them and he says, look, see to it, man. I have washed my hands of this man's blood. And you know what he says? This innocent man's blood. Pontius knew that Jesus had done nothing wrong and nothing deserving of death. And the Jews cried out, the people there answered, his blood be on us and our children. Imagine that. They were saying, you know what? The consequences for what you're doing right now, let that be upon us as a people and our children. And not even 40 years passed before the events that Jesus talked about. Now, guys, here's what's interesting. As you're looking at, at Luke's account of it, He's really very specific toward Jerusalem. But if you read Matthew and Mark's account of it, he's talking about the world, which is interesting because it's as though what really is happening in Jerusalem is just a dress rehearsal for what's going to happen on a global scale. God is going to pour out his wrath upon the world. Just like he poured out his wrath upon the city of Jerusalem, his vengeance. There's going to come a time where God will judge, where God will bring account for men and his actions against God. And it's an interesting passage because he's saying, look, understand, this, this is the vengeance of God. Notice what he says uh, in, in, in the end of verse 23. He says, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Wrath. Guys, God sent his son in the, to this world in order for God's wrath not be required of us. God came into this world, became a man, and took the wrath upon himself so that the wrath would be satisfied, the payment for sin would be paid for rather than us having to take it upon ourselves. That's the whole gospel message. We're sinners deserving of God's wrath. But God made a way for us to be forgiven. And the wrath that we deserve gets poured upon Jesus Christ and his payment, even though he never sinned, was for us. It tells us in the book of Romans chapter 5 in the 8th verse, it says this, But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. It tells us in the book of John chapter 3, we all know John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. If you read down a little bit further in John chapter 3 verse 36, it says this. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath of God. It tells us in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says this, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, God never desired for his wrath to be poured upon the people unless what they rejected, the solution to sin. And if you've, reje- if you've received Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, understand this, God's wrath will never be poured out upon you. Because the wrath of God was poured upon Jesus as he paid the price for sin for us. And what happened on a city scale is going to happen on a global scale one day. Matthew is the one who kind of explains that in greater detail. Now, Everyone, you know, when, you go, when, you, when you're going through the book, you know, you get to the end of the Bible, you come to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is laying out for us, uh, you know, the things that are, are to come. 
And, he, and from chapter 6 all the way to chapter 19 in the book of Revelation is talking about this time period where God's going to pour out his wrath upon the whole world. And the whole world's going to be aware of what's happening. It's not going to be like a coincidence or this is a chance or this is global warming or this is, you know, some natural disaster. The whole world's going to be aware that, you know what, what's happening is that God is pouring out his wrath. It tells us in Revelation 6.16, it says this, and, and those that were there said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand wow can you imagine there are going to be a group of people that are going to be on the face of the earth they're going to know you know what everything that's happening in this world is because the wrath of God is being poured out upon us and the most merciful thing was to let the mountains fall on us and so you have in this particular uh, uh, passage, Jesus is saying, look, this is what's going to happen. You guys as a nation, you're going you're, you're to experience God's vengeance. You're going to experience God's wrath. And then he says this, you're going to be carried into all of the nations. Now, this is, this is what's interesting, guys, because you and I, because of where we're at in history, where we're at in, in, this, in, this, in this timeline, we're able to look back and say, you know, did these things happen? As Titus and the soldiers that were with him, they slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Jews. It was said that there were close to 100,000 of them that were taken into Rome and they were paraded around the streets and not only to Rome, but they were spread throughout the globe. And it wasn't until 1948 that Israel becomes a nation again. That's some 1,900 years down the road where the Jews are regathered again. And you know, you know what blows my mind as you read that? It, I, I would encourage you, if you're interested on the subject, go back and read the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, chapter 38, and chapter 39, because God tells them that there, is, there are a bunch of dead bones, that they, they had been, you know, total destruction come upon them, and then all of a sudden they were going to put life back into them, flesh back on their bones, and they were going to regather together again in the nation of Israel. And you and I, because we're at where we're at in history, we're able to say not only did destruction take place, but God has regathered them again in the city of Jerusalem and in the nation of Israel in these last 1900 years. Prophecy fulfilled. He's laid out all of these things for us. He's, he's, you know, he, he's given us the instruction. And if you read 37, 38, 39, it tells us not just up until them regathering, but how the nations of the world are going to gather against them one more time to destroy them. And then God's going to intervene. All of these things told in the Bible. All of these prophecies declared before they ever happen. And there's something very interesting as you look at the end of verse uh, verse. 24, he says, you're going to be, you know, fall by the edge of the sword. You're going to be captive into all nations. And watch what he says. And Jerusalem will be trampled by who? By Gentiles. Until when? Until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Here, here, here's what, what's, what's amazing. For 2,000 years, God was dealing with the Jew the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham. From Abraham to Jesus was how long, guys? 2,000 years. And then after that 2,000-year period, what happened in 70 AD? God's wrath was poured upon the city of Jerusalem. From the time of Jesus till today, what are we going on? 2,000 years. God dealing with the Gentiles. And what is coming to is the wrath of God being poured out upon the whole world. It's amazing. You know, all of these things that God's declaring, you know, it was kind of happened on a local scale. Now it's going to happen on a global scale. Not just with the Jew, but with the Gentile. And as God is dealing with all of his creation, and what's amazing, he says, look, there's going to come this time of the Gentiles, and it's going to be fulfilled. The Gentiles, are their, their time is going to be done. And one of the things we know, and we'll get to in a second, one of the things we know in Scripture is that God isn't done with the nation of Israel, that 69 weeks were completed when Jesus was cut off, but there's one week or one has to happen. 
biblically. Where God is going to be dealing specifically with the nation of Israel, where his wrath is going to be poured out upon the Gentile nations. It's incredible how he, he lays all of these things out. One of the things you, you find is as you're reading through the book of Romans, when you come to Romans chapter 11, what Paul is telling the Roman church, who the, the, the Jews that were in Rome and those, you know, I'm sorry, the Christians that were in Rome concerning the Jews, he said, look, God's not done with Israel. Don't start thinking that, you know, God's done with Israel and now God's just going to be dealing with the Gentiles. God's going to continue to deal with the Jew. And then he says this at the end of verse 25 there in Romans chapter 11. He says, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. Watch what he says, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until what? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, that last Gentile gets saved, and then God's going to be done dealing with the Gentile people, and he's going to deal once again for seven years with the Jewish people, specifically. And what's incredible is that the scripture's so clear that there is a time frame and there's a a certain number of Gentiles that are going to get saved. And once that last Gentile gets saved, and and then what, we're going to have a different time in the clock, prophetically. And if you have not gotten saved, man, and you're still here with the, what, the next event that will take place is that Jesus is coming back for his church, for his bride. And he's going to take his bride up to heaven. And then at that point, seven years is going to happen where God is going to pour out his wrath upon the world. All of it laid out for us. Romans chapter, I mean, Revelation chapter six, you can just start reading there. You're going to find out what's going to happen afterwards. Incredible. Incredible. And as Jesus is telling them, look, once the Gentile time is done, once it's fulfilled, once the last ones come in, and then I'm going to be doing what? I'm going to be dealing specifically with the Jewish people. And what's amazing about these next, you know, eight verses that we're covering this morning is that he's telling us the things that are leading up to that time period. He's telling you the things that will happen at the beginning of that time period, the things that are going to happen at the middle of that time period, and then the things that are going to happen at the end of that time period. He lays it all out in this sermon on the mount. He's laying, laying, look, things are going to get intense. Things are going to continue to to become more frequent. And then as all of a sudden that last Gentile comes to faith, then you're going to experience what? The tribulation that's going to come upon the whole world. Now, If you were to go back to the book of Daniel, Daniel gives us the same account, which was written hundreds of years before Jesus gave it. Watch, turn real quick to Daniel chapter 9. Go backwards to the Old Testament. The ninth chapter of the book of Daniel. Watch what he says beginning in verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish transgressions, to end, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation of, for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. He goes, look, there's going to be 70 weeks that are going to take place. Now, here, here, here's what we do know that 69 of those weeks have already been completed. We're going to see that in verse 25. Watch what he says. Look at verse 25. Now, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, or a total of 69 weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. What? 
Here's, here's the deal, guys. From the command to go and rebuild Jerusalem, that would have happened in the time of Nehemiah. And if you take the Neo, time of Nehemiah, 69 times 7 is 483. And you take 483 years from the time that Nehemiah was given the command until Jesus comes riding in on the donkey, it's 483 years to the day. Is that mind-boggling to anybody else than me? To the very day, 483 years, you go on a 360-day year scale or, or, or a year uh, time frame, and you would come exactly to the day that Jesus comes riding in on a donkey, declaring himself to be the Messiah. To the day. Just like the scripture said. So uh, it's unbelievable. And then he's telling them, look, the Messiah is going to be cut off, and he's not going to be cut off for himself. Who's going to be cut off for? For the sins of the world. Jesus didn't die for himself. He didn't die for his own sin. He died for your sins and my sins and for every sin that was ever committed. And then as he continues there, man, check this out. Incredible. Look at the next verse. He says, And the people, the prince who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood until the end of war. Desolations are determined. He's saying, look, what's going to happen? That same prince who was the Roman guard, it, it's going to be the revised Roman Empire, and they're going to come in, and they're going to, they're going to attack the city one more time. And then this is what's heavy, man. He says they're going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. And just, I mean, we know all these things. Incredible. And then watch, watch what he says. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In other words, until the end of time, and, and there's going to be a covenant made for one final week of world history, man. and that's where God is pouring out his wrath, and that's where God is dealing with the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. And Jesus is telling these things before, you know, in his last sermon. Think about that. Matthew gives us the account that he, he equates it to the abomination of desolation at the end of the age. And this abomination that was taking place was the destruction of the temple. And yet they correlate side by side. Notice, if you were to continue down, it, it tells us this. When the abomination of desolation takes place, when Satan, he's going to go into the temple, and, and it's going to be the Antichrist, and he's going to be empowered and filled with Satan, and he's going to go into the temple, and he's going to proclaim himself to be God. And once that happens, there's only 1,290 days left before the end of the age and before the coming of the Son of Man. It tells us in Daniel, if you're already there in Daniel, look, turn, turn to chapter 12, look at verse 11. He tells us that, that very same uh, idea of, of this abomination of desolation there in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. He says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. What does that equate? Three and a half years on a 360-day time period. Un. Believable, man. All of these things that he had already determined. Matthew chapter 24, in this same parallel passage that we're in Luke, he says this. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, he who reads, let him understand. He says in Mark chapter 13, another parallel passage of Luke chapter 21, he says this, he says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where he ought not, let the reader understand, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Grace, he's talking about parallel events, one of them on a small scale, one on a large scale, one for Jerusalem, one for the world. And God one day is going to pour out his wrath upon the whole world. And those who've rejected the Messiah as their Lord and Savior. And it's amazing because Paul, when he's writing to the Thessalonians, they thought that they had missed the rapture. They thought they had missed the coming of the Lord. And so the Thessalonians were, you know, all panicking. 
And Paul writes to them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had already come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For the day will not come unless the fallen away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself to be God. And that's the abomination of desolation that's going to happen at the end of the age and the Antichrist is going to go into the temple and he's going to say, look, no longer can you sacrifice to God, now you have to worship me. This, 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 this is the things that Jesus is declaring to his disciples. And I think to anyone in this world, man, I think it'd be incredible because, you know, he's, he's not telling us these things to scare us. He's telling these things to warn us. And we should be warned. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. God's desire is that what you're forgiven for your sin because without the forgiveness of sin, you're going to have to pay the price for sin. It's the wrath of God. And so he lays out all of these things, man, for his disciples to, you know, to decipher and to think about. And, and then notice what happens. Go, go back to Luke, man. I mean, he's talking about all the time of the Gentiles. And watch what he says in verse 25. He says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear of the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, he's talking about the end of the time of the Gentiles, which is what, right before the, the seven years of tribulation. Now, as he's talking, verse 25, he's talking about the beginning of the tribulation. And he's talking about it's going to be a time where there's going to be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, the earth, nations in distress, men's hearts failing them because there's, there's going to be an awareness that there's something happening. You go back to Revelation chapter 6, and we looked a little bit at, uh, at the end of it, but that chapter 6, verse 12, it says this, And I looked, and he opened up the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell on the earth as fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind and the sky receded as a scroll when it rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place and the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, the every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and they said to the mountains of the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Wow. And those things that Jesus described in verse 25, we see described in Revelation chapter 6, which is at the beginning of the tribulation period. The sun, the moon, the stars, the ocean raging, all of these things. And, and, it's, and everyone knows what? This is God's wrath being poured out. He tells all these things. And it should cause us, you know, as if you're a Christian here, it shouldn't cause fear. It should be going, man, you know what? I need to be living for the Lord. I need, to be, I need to be, you know, out sharing my faith. I need to tell my friends. I need to tell, you know, my neighbors. I need to tell my coworkers that God loves them and that they can escape God's wrath. If you don't know Jesus this morning, uh, you know what? It should scare you. <laughs> Straight out, it should. Because you're fighting against God. How do you win that battle? You don't. You're in opposition to truth. And what Jesus is declaring to them, he said, look, this is how bad it's going to be. Men's hearts are going to be failing. Guys, we're living in a culture where, where fear is, is rampant. People are living in fear. Anxiety, stress. You don't have to look at the news very long before you're going, man, something crazy is going on around here. And it seems to be getting, you know, more intense and more frequent. 
You can't even, you know, you, the, the crazy thing is you, you watch the news cycle for one day and then you, you know, you used to be able to, you watch it one day, you kind of got the whole week figured out. You now, you, you, you watch it one day and then the next day you've got a whole new news cycle. Because things are happening so rapidly. And it should cause us as, 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 the, as the church to go, man, you know what, I, 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 need, I need to be living with some anticipation, some, some, some expectation in my life. But notice what happens next, man. I mean, so he's talking about the beginning of the tribulation period. And then look what he says at the end of this. Look at verse 27. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. And the power and the great glory. And when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Wow. Then. You'll see these things. You'll see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. Now, that, that, that's, think about what Jesus just did. He, he took us from, the, from, from before the tribulation period to the beginning of the tribulation. He took us to the middle of the abomination of desolation, the middle of the tribulation period, and then he's taken us all the way to the coming of the Son of Man, the end of the tribulation period, and he's laying all of these things out for us. And you know what he says in that? He says, when you see these things begin to happen, look up. He didn't say, when it's all over, look up. He said, before these things ever take place, you're just seeing, you know, the things leading up to it. You should be looking up because he's talking about a different event. I'm convinced that he's not talking about the second coming here. He's not talking about what, he, what, what, he's, what he's just declared uh, there in verse 27. He says, you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Because what we found out in Daniel chapter 12 is that when the abomination of desolation happens, you're going to be able to mark off your calendar 1,290 days from that point, and you're going to know that that's when Jesus is coming back. It's not going to be a surprise. The surprise is, is that before these events take place, he's going to come and he's going to come in a twinkle of an eye and no one's going to know, man, when he's coming, but he's going to come suddenly and then those that are in Christ are going to be taken up into heaven and that's going to be something that's going to happen without notice, just like a thief in the night. It's going to happen, you know, and, and here, here's, here's, here's what blows my mind, man. Everything that's had to happen prophetically has already happened. The only thing you and I are waiting for, church, is for Jesus to come back for his bride. Everything else has already happened. The nation of Israel gathering together again as a nation, it's already happened 70 years ago. All of the events leading up to, the only thing that's left prophetically is the things that happen from the time of the tribulation forward. Everything else is set up. And there was a time when you were reading some of these scriptures going, how is that going to happen? That don't even make sense. I remember when I got saved, I'm going, I'm going on 30 years ago when I, when I came to the Lord. And, and there was the question like, well, a cashless society, how is that going to happen? Anybody wonder how that's going to happen today? We're almost there at a cast of society. You're not going to be able to buy, sell, or trade unless you take a mark, the scripture says. The mark of the beast. And, and, and you're not going to be able to go into the store and, and purchase your food or to, you know, have any kind of commodities exchanged unless you take a mark of the beast. And, you know, you thought, man, how's that going to happen? It's, it's, it's plausible right now. It's not something you have to guess. It's something that you and I, because of the generation we're living in, we can see how that can happen. It tells us that there's going to be an image inside of the temple when the, de when, when the Antichrist goes into the temple, there's going to be an image of him and you're going to have to bow down to worship him. Do you, you guys watch the news this week? They, at the Reagan uh, library, they have Ronald Reagan and he's fully uh, animate, animated in a, in a hologram. And it looks like Ronald Reagan is standing right there. And, and the first thing I thought about, man, that's how they're going to do the Antichrist. He's going he's to be able to be in two places at once. He's going to be in the temple and everyone's got to bow down and worship him. And, you know, you just, you know, just like, man, oh, that's plausible now. I, I, that was implausible before. It's plausible now. It tells us in, in the book of Revelations that there's going to be two witnesses and they're going to be at the front 
uh, uh, in Jerusalem, and they're going to be at the temple, and they're, they're going to be warning everybody. Everyone's going to hate him. They're going to want to kill him, but they're telling everybody God's plan, and God, you know, God's judgment's going to come upon the earth. He's telling all these things are because God's wrath is being poured, and, and, uh, and those two witnesses are going to be, and it says that every eye will watch as they are killed, and then they're resurrected right in front of everybody. And for the longest time, like, how's every, I mean, come on, every eye is going to see him. How are the guys in, you know, in, in Berlin going to see him? Now, now all you got to do is get an Amber Alert. Straight to your phone, you'll, you'll get a video. Boom, I just watched those two witnesses resurrect right in front of me. Every eye. Guys, we're living in a culture. When you're reading the book of Revelation and you're reading the, the, the prophecies of Scripture, you're going, man, all of this stuff is plausible in our day. And it should cause us to have an expectation that Jesus is coming back in our lifetime. It should cause us to have an urgency that I want my family, my friends to know Christ and to be forgiven for their sins. It should cause us to to have a, 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 a passion to go and reach our next generation. Because this is the days you and I are living in. And, and, I, and I, I love, I love what, he's, what, what, he, what he says here. He says, look, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. I, I don't know about you, but I know when I leave the house anymore, I just kind of, okay, not today. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. We're still, I'm still here. You should be looking up. We should be having an expectation, you know, that our redemption, that, that, that's, a, that's an incredible word. The, word. the word redemption means that you've been released from painful interrogation or you've been released from prison. And that's exactly what's happened to those of us who've come to faith in Jesus Christ. We were once pre- prisoners of the devil and now what we've been freed from that bondage, man, of sin and the consequence of sin so that now what we now are in a relationship with Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished on our behalf. You're not in bondage anymore. You've been freed. And then that word also means to be released from captivity to be delivered or for someone to pay the price that you owed so that you can be freed. Wow. And that's why Jesus came into this world. To pay the price for sin. And if you don't have Jesus pay the price for sin for you, then you'll have to pay the price yourself. And the price for sin is death. And it's the wrath of God that will come upon the whole world. You see, the Bible talks about a time when before all these things, events take place, that he's going to come and he's going to take his bride. Now, understand something. We have a lot of examples of that in the scriptures. That, and, and, you know, there's three different views, you know, three main views when it comes to, you know, uh, Christianity. One is that the church is going to be uh, here for the whole tribulation period that we're going to experience everything that Revelation 6 to chapter 19 declares and that the church is going to come and they call that a post-tribulation viewpoint, that the church is going to experience that whole time period. There's another view that says, and they're called mid-tribs, mid-tribulationists, and they believe that after three and a half years that the church is going to be taken out to three and a half point mark. I believe that we're going to be taken out at the beginning of it, and it's called a pre-tribulation viewpoint, and the pre-tribs believe that God is not going to pour out his wrath upon his bride. That we're the bride of Christ, and we have an example of that throughout Scripture. Think about this. Before God brought wrath upon uh, the ancient world and the flood, what did he do? He took out Lot, his wife, and their three children, and their wives. God spared his own before his wrath was poured out. Think about Lot and Lot's daughters. They were warned before he ever poured out his wrath upon Sodom and Gomorrah, he pulled them out of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
before God's wrath ever came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And I believe that same character of God will be dispensed in the last days. It tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And th- you're not going to have a warning. It's like a thief in the night. He's going to come. He's going to take us, you know, and we're going to be taken out of here. Matter of fact, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, and we'll wrap it up right here. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive shall be caught up. Now that word caught up, is the word harpasso in the Greek. It's a, it, 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 what it literally means to be snatched away. It's in, in, the, in the Latin, it's the word rapturo. It's where we get the English word rapture. Someone's going to come and tell you, look, the Bible though never says the word rapture. It doesn't say the word rapture. It uses the word harpasso where we translate to rapture, but it has the same meaning that we're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. That's that, that, that's, that's that event that we're talking about that happens just prior to God's wrath being poured out upon the world and that seven year tribulation period that the Bible declares. And Jesus in this time, he says, look, when you see these things beginning to happen, look up. Your redemption draws near. And you and I, church, should be looking up. We should, we should, we should, we should have an expectation and an and, 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 and actual, you know, it, it's interesting. And we, we don't got time. We, we, the, the next few verses, Jesus is going to give j- just a simple application to what he just taught. He's going he's to give a very, and, but I do want to look at one verse in that. Look at verse 34. And I think here, it, I don't want to walk away without getting the gist of what Jesus is declaring and why he's declaring it. Look what he says in verse 34 of chapter 21. He says, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And that day come upon you unexpectedly. Wow. He says, take heed. What's that? Warning. Take heed. Because the tendency is for our hearts to be weighed down with this world, with drunkenness, and with the cares of this life. We just kind of, it's really easy just to kind of get distracted with with all of the things that, you know, life throws at us and all the temptation that that come at us. And, you know, it's really easy to kind of get your, your whole focus here rather than looking up. And he's encouraging us, what? Look up. Look up. Keep your eyes on heaven. Make that the, 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 the point, you know, the, the place where, where, where your attention is, that, that you, you start to see all these things to happen, and you go, man, it's close. I, I, I need to be ready. I need to be watching. I need to be expecting Jesus to come back. And don't get, don't get caught up with this world, the drunkenness and the carousing and the cares of this life, because you'll miss it. And I think that's what Jesus, and, and we'll, we'll pick that up next week. You know, you, you start to see all these things, and, and it should cause us, like, man, th- those things are happening. They're happening right around it. You know, we're, we're, we're entering into a new season right now. We're, we're heading toward, toward winter. And you know that because you wake up in the morning, it's got a little bit of, you know, a little brisk outside. You kind of get your little sweater on because, man, it's, a, it's colder now than it was a month ago. You look at the leaves. You pass by, you know, the, the, the Rio Grande. You kind of start to see yellow starting to come in the leaves. You go, man, you know, we're leaving summer. We're in spring. You're going to winter. We, we can see those things because they're happening around us. Right now, you can go to Walmart. And you can see all the Christmas displays. 
You know Thanksgiving's right around the corner. <laughs> because you, you, you can make some observations. And you start to prepare yourself for those observations. You start to go, man, you know, I need to pull out my winter clothes. I got to start thinking about presents. I got to start, you know, you, you start to make changes based upon the knowledge that you have. And I think it's exactly what Jesus is telling our generation. Start to make the changes based upon the things that you see, knowing that your redemption draws near.